All right, today I'm going to be talking about Oscar Wilde and um, Impression du Matin. Um, so Oscar Wilde is a very controversial uh, British writer. Uh, there is a tail end of the Victorian period. He was Irish. He was born in Dublin in uh, 1854. His mother was, um, her name was Lady Jane Francesca Wilde. She was a successful poet and a journalist. Uh, and she wrote a patriotic Irish verse under the pen name or the pseudonym Speranza. Her, his father was Sir William Wilde. He was an eye and ear surgeon, um, a philanthropist, a gifted writer himself. He wrote books on archaeology and folklore. Um, he had an elder brother, Willie, and a younger sister, Athela Francesca, who died um, when she was 10 years old. Educated, well-educated, Portrait Royal School, Royal School, Trinity College in Dublin, Magdalen College in Oxford. Um, he was really involved in the aesthetic movement of the time period in Ireland. Uh, he became an advocate for L'Art pour L'Art, which is art for art's sake, um, uh, and won um, some awards for some of his early works, um, including uh, the Newdigate Prize in 1878 for Ravenna. Moved to Chelsea uh, to establish a literary career after he graduated, published his first collection of poems. He kind of received uh, mixed reviews by the critics. Uh, he worked for a time as an art reviewer. He lectured uh, United States, Canada, Britain, Ireland. He lived in Paris. Um, in 1884, he married Constance Lloyd. She was the daughter of the wealthy Queen's Council, Horace Lloyd. Um, they had two sons together, Cyril and Vivian. Um, to support his family, he worked as the editor of Woman's World magazine, where he worked from 1887 to 1889. In 1888, he published The Happy Prince and Other Tales, which is a collection of fairy tale stories that he wrote for his two sons. Um, and he wrote one novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, which was published in 1891. And it really received quite a negative response. Um, it had a, a lot to do with the fact that the novel had a kind of homoerotic overtones um and that was a sensation right at, for the victorian uh critics and writers 1891 he began an affair with lord alfred douglas who was nicknamed bosey um and who was really the love of his life uh and it became his downfall as well his marriage ended uh to his marriage to his female wife ended in 1893. His greatest talent was for writing plays. Uh, his first successful play was Lady Windermere's Fan. It opened uh, in 1892. Um, he produced a string of extremely popular comedies, including A Woman of No Importance, An Ideal Husband, and probably the one he's most famous for, which is The Importance of Being Earnest in 1895. All those plays were highly acclaimed and firmly established Wilde as a playwright. So in 1895, in April of 1895, Wilde uh, sued Bosey's father, Lord Alfred Douglas's father, for libel. Um, uh, he was the, uh, Lord Alfred Douglas's father was the Marquis of King Queensberry, um, and he had accused him of homosexuality, which he was, but still, you got to think, in the time period, you know, that was like a death sentence. You know, they wanted to kind of keep that under wraps. Um, so he sued him for libel. His case was unsuccessful. He was arrested and tried for gross indecency. Sentenced to two years of hard labor for the crime of sodomy. During his time in prison, uh, he wrote De Profundis, which was a dramatic monologue and an autobiography, which he addressed to Bosey. Um, he was released in 1897. He wrote The Ballad of Reading Jail. Uh, which revealed his concern for inhumane prison conditions. And then he spent the rest of his life kind of wandering Europe, uh, staying with friends, living in cheap hotels, um, and died of, he developed an ear infection, which developed into cerebral meningitis, uh, and died in a cheap Paris hotel with no money, completely penniless, on November the 30th, 1900. So today I'm going to be talking about Impression du Matin, which means Impression of the Morning. We got four quatrains here. We have an uncomplicated A, B, B, A, 
ABBA. I always have a hiccup when I'm talking. I'm sorry. So if you hear me, like I'm hiccuping. ABBA rhyme scheme. Very simple rhymes. Gray, hay, gold, cold, you know, down, uh, town. Though just very simple, very simple feel to the whole poem. Um, but very powerful and, and very descriptive. A lot of musicality and a lot of musical kind of language. It, it makes it sound more like a uh, a song really then um but but more specifically it kind of makes it sound like a uh, an art a piece of art itself and so that is actually kind of i think what he intended because many people have said that wild's work is kind of the poetic version of whistler's art um reginald john rex whistler was a british artist painted murals society portraits designed theatrical uh, theatrical costumes um, and so in that first stanza that we're going to see the thing, uh, the Thames, a nocturne of blue and gold, um, nocturne in blue and gold is a direct reference to Whistler and one of his paintings. Um, so for all intents and purposes, Impression du Matin is a painting in words. Um, let's take a look and we'll kind of break it down. So the Thames nocturne of blue and gold changed to a harmony in gray, a barge with ochre colored hay dropped from the wharf and chill and cold. The yellow fog came creeping down the bridges till the house walls, the house's walls seemed to change seemed change to shadows and St. Paul's loomed like a bubble or the town. Then suddenly arose the clang of waking life. The streets were stirred with country wagons and a bird flew to the glistening roofs and sang. But one pale woman all alone, the daylight kissing her wan hair, loitered beneath the gas lamp's flare with lips of flame and heart of stone. So he's using enjambment here. You can see how the line, the the sentence doesn't end with the line that they, the Thames nocturne of blue and gold changed to a harmony in gray. The yellow fog came creeping down the bridges, so he's using enjambment where it runs into the next line. Uh, we've got four, uh, we've got tetra, not tetrameter, yeah, tetrameter, iambic tetrameter, which is four, uh, four iams or four beats per line, so eight syllables per line here. Um, so the first three stanzas are a clear linear progression progression from night to day, um, from stillness to movement and waking life. Um, we have the departing night, the incumbent dawn, the imminent daylight, and daybreak erases the blue and gold of the nighttime at Thames, the river in London, and a chill yellow fog. You know, fog is London's kind of calling cards. Everything is fog, right? Right. Uh, daytime fog, nighttime fog, <laughs> morning, early morning fog. Um, it creeps over London and throws the houses into shadows. Um, and even the the St. Paul's, you know, is like a bubble. It's not. It's not distinct. It's kind of like in its own kind of ethereal atmosphere kind of looming over the town like a bubble um and then everything starts waking up right so then suddenly arose the clang of waking life the streets are starting to stir wagons are on the roads birds are flying they're flying to the rooftops and they're singing um you know we find ourselves here in that third stanza with, on a with the city on a city that is coming to life on the cusp of a city that is coming to life you know this point kind of really reminds me of words words um, lines composed on Westminster Bridge, and we we talked about the. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Was it? That was the bridge. The London, uh, the London poem, and I don't know why that my brain just kind of completely shut off when when he's describing London waking up, the city waking up. And so, um, this kind of kind of reminds me of that uh, kind of that progression from uh, you know not time to the early morning before the city is kind of fully awake, um, and then it kind of changes here in the third stanza, and I mean in the final stanza. But one pale woman all alone, the daylight kissing her wan hair, loitered beneath the gas lamps flare with lips of flame and heart of stone so we get this lone figure this lone woman she's all by herself she's bathed in the daylight right that the daylight is just kissing her one hair so she is 
she's kind of like uh, standing on a street corner beneath a gas lamp and the sun is just starting to kind of like touch her um the daylight is just starting to kind of touch her hair you know it's one it's very pale uh maybe she's blonde um but the the daylight is just kissing her hair but she's kind of really reluctant she's loitering she's just kind of hanging out beneath this gas lamp trying to hold on to the remnants of the night um you know with her lips of flame and her heart of stone she's likely a streetwalker or a prostitute who earns her living in the night and which would explain why she's kind of reluctant to step out into the daylight why she's clinging to the nighttime it's where she earns her income and and you know she's her kind is is not you know accepted in the daytime right those are nighttime things so she's kind of hanging out there underneath the um the 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 street lamp kind of uh reluctant to let go of the night time and uh and, and and step out into the light of day very interesting piece here impression du matin by oscar wilde <laughs> 